evening to everybody live and in the room. Um, I'm Bonnie Adario, uh, founder of uh, this foundation. This is David LaDuke, our executive director. Uh, we're happy to have you all here tonight. Danielle is missing, um, who is usually our uh, number, number one person. She broke her foot in Nashville. There's more to that story. I'm sure we can, we can talk later. But I'm also sure she's dialed in. There's no doubt in my mind. Yes, she's in. She's in. So she would be very sad if I didn't mention that. Hey, Gimpy. Um, <clears throat> our special guest tonight is Sherry Millis with Foundation Medicine in Boston. Um, her title is Senior Medical Science Liaison and Research Scientist, and she's also a PhD. That's a big title, Sherry. <laughs> We're expecting big things tonight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's get, get started. I believe you have a couple slides maybe that you want to show before you start speaking. Yeah, I thought okay. I would go ahead and give some background. Uh, we're going to talk about genomic sequencing and how that can impact your you outcome uh, as a patient. So I'm going to start with, uh, just want to make sure those slides are up there. Um, try to level set everybody to, to what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to start by talking about precision medicine or personalized medicine, uh, uh, two different ways that we talk about how we are improving patients' outcomes in cancer specifically by uh, focusing on the biology of the patient's disease as opposed to uh, looking at the histology. So for example, with lung cancer, uh, we say a patient has lung cancer, but each patient is unique and each patient might have a different type of lung cancer. So we try to identify... I'm sorry, Sherry. I don't think we can hear you either. I don't think Sherry's... She's fine. I'm, I'm probably just not talking People down here. People are saying they can't hear. <laughs> you, okay. can, you can hear me okay? All right. Okay. If you can't, just holler at me. I, I respond very well to being hollered at. Um, so, so if we're looking at lung cancer, uh, each one is unique, and so we're trying to identify at the biology what makes what's driving our lung cancer. So historically, we would give every patient the same chemotherapy. It would make most everybody sick, and some people would do well, and some people would do not would not do well. But uh, in the the era of personalized medicine, we're able to identify specifically what is driving the patient's cancer, regardless of the histology, in order to then. Uh, treat the patient with unique targeted therapies as we call them and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but we're, we're basically identifying what's the unique biology and then targeting that biology with specific treatments that are going to be more efficacious uh, or choosing not to use a treatment that's not going to have efficacy for that patient so we're trying to help you uh, get to the therapies that will uh, help you respond and the, and not give you therapies that are going to make you sick so with that in mind, I'm going to just talk a little bit about our biology, and, and I'll try not to do too much of that. I'm a scientist, so I could talk about biology for days, but uh, I know not everybody's very interested in that. Uh, in fact, my husband is an English major, and he tries to have me dial it down on most occasions. So, um, But with that, our unique biology is what makes us us. And I've got a picture of a piece of DNA there. And, and what happens is that um, uh, the DNA is what's in every nucleated cell in our body. And it's what's telling our body what to do at the cellular level. Uh, for example, um, my DNA uh, has specific genes. We all have genes, but they tell us different things. So it's kind of like uh, words in a sentence, if you will. And, and, and in my DNA, I have a sentence that says, Sherry has brown hair. Um, and over the course of our life, every time those cells divide, that DNA is replicated or, or copied, like on a copy machine, if you will. And, and, and when it's copied, if, if an error has occurred or damage has occurred, it's copied with that damage in it. So over the course of our life, what happens is that um, carcinogens, uh, viruses, bacteria, all of this impact us. Or the sun, for example. Every time the sun hits our skin, it's has the potential to damage the DNA. So as that DNA is damaged over the course of our life, uh, the body tries to replicate or copy the DNA, and it might copy it, uh, that, that now damaged piece, uh, in a way that, that tells it something different. So for example, my DNA used to say Sherry's hair is brown, now it says Sherry's hair is gray. 
Um, that, that's a somewhat innocuous DNA damage that occurs over the course of our life, but um, there's damage that can cause things like lung cancer. So the carcinogens in the environment that we breathe, they're going to impact us, et cetera. So uh, cancer is typically thought of as a disease of, an, of the aging specifically for that reason, because the, the DNA over the course of our life has damage that occurs to it. We have systems in place biologically that try to correct that DNA damage, but that doesn't always work well either. So another area of DNA damage is in uh, inability to repair that DNA. So, so based on that information, um, I want to now kind of change it a little bit and talk about how do we look at each individual's DNA to identify what damage has occurred or what change in the genes has occurred that is driving their cancer. So when I say driving, basically the DNA is, again, as I mentioned, causing the cellular functions to occur. And often the DNA damage that occurs in cancer is damage that uh, t does not allow the cell to stop or die naturally and, and have a new cell generated. And so the, it keeps being constitutively activated or activated forever. And so those cells keep dividing and keep propagating that, that misread uh, DNA or that, that DNA damage. So, so how do we look at the DNA that's been damaged and identify what the specific damage is in order to then identify what kind of therapy will target that specifically damaged DNA and not the rest of the DNA? So with that, I have a, a quick schematic here that tells you a little bit about how we do this genomic profiling, as we call it. So genomic profiling is another way to say we're looking at the DNA to see what has damaged it, to see what the new coding sequence in the DNA is uh, in order to determine the, the targeted therapy for a patient to use. So schematically, uh, I've got a picture of a piece of tissue or blood because we now can do this both by getting a tissue biopsy or looking at a, a, a portion of our blood or a liquid biopsy as we uh, typically term this. We put that into a magical science instrument that gen then looks at all of the DNA and identifies where those errors are in, in the DNA. And, and from that, we're able to identify the specific genes that are involved in, in the cancer. So once that information is generated, um, this gives us information about what is driving the patient's cancer. And we can then actually uh, take that information and connect it to the therapies that are available on the market or therapies that are in clinical trials or even take that information to uh, the pharmaceutical companies to help generate new drugs going forward. So with that, I'm gonna just leave us on a blank screen so that we can talk about some of the questions that have arisen around uh, genomics in cancer. Okay, this is great. I thought, you know, normally we go around the room when we first start, but I thought your introduction would get everybody excited to talk about what their specific um, issue is and what their target is. So you'll have an idea of, yeah, that's of, great. of who we've got in the room. So Esty, um, your market is um, your marker is a KRAS marker. Microphone next to you there. You have a microphone right next to you. <laughs> Thank you, Francis. Okay. I, I caught Esty with a mouthful of pasta. <laughs> I think it was KRAS. No, no, it wasn't KRAS. It's, it has four different letters. EGFR. PGA. Okay. 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 I okay. Because nobody could test it in the first Okay. 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 And that was four, 14 years ago. Yeah. About yeah. Two thousand three. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. And so. Um, what does that mean? Maybe she. Yeah. <laughs> well. And you've recently had a, a little recurrence and had some radiation. Yeah, and that was something else that was on the other lung, and that was uh, little spots that are ground glass type of things. Mm -hmm. And one of them didn't look too good. They don't know if it was bad or didn't look good. Oh. Okay, one that there didn't you look go. good. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, therefore um, they did target the radiation on it with uh, the linear accelerator um, at Stanford, 
And he said, looks fine, but I have to go every... First it was six months, now he says nine months. Okay, okay, well, that's good news. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Esty. Francis? I'd like to know the difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi, my name is Francis, um, a 10-year survivor. And that's actually the reason why I'm here. It's a good segue, actually, because uh, um, what is it I want to do or need to do to find out if I should uh, do one of these studies, find out if, if, if there is abnormal, uh, I had lung cancer, so there, so there was an abnormality in my DNA. So can that be, uh, can we find out? What's the look into the future from that sense? So you were never tested? I was never tested. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, and this was 10 years ago? This is 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And I'm and sure there's many people like me, you know, never tested. And rather than waiting for the shoe, shoe to drop, I'd, I'd rather be more proactive and find out, okay, is there anything I can do to okay. not let the shoe drop? And what therapy did you have, Francis? I had a, um, a lobectomy, right upper lobectomy, and uh, 12 weeks of chemotherapy. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Rosalind Spruitt. I'm Francis's wife and caregiver. So I'm very interested in any new developments in this field. Thank you. Ron, are you gonna say a few words? Ron Fong? That's you. We're gonna do the, you inner, go we're gonna do the inner ring first. Okay, Yeah, okay. we'll go to the outer okay. ring. Okay, Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Yep, there he goes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ron Fong. Um, my wife, Joan, had an EGFR exon 19 deletion, um, a type 1, I understand. Um, I just learned this week that there are 53 types of exon 19. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Anyway, I'm an advocate at this point. Hi, my name is Trey Regallo. I'm with uh, Foundation Medicine, one of the companies that, that does this type of testing, and I'm here uh, with Sherry and some others from our team. Great. Awesome. Thank you. I'm David Marshak, also with Foundation Medicine. Krista Gallucci, also with Foundation Medicine. And Jackie Moriarty with Foundation Medicine. Thanks Thank for you. having us. Glad to Lots have you of here. people for you to talk to later when we That's right. when we break. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my name is Fred Palmer. I was uh, <clears throat> diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer in October of 2013. I'm currently on uh, immunotherapy, and it's working. Wonderful. Uh, I'm uh, very early on, even before Kaiser started testing f for genomic profiling, I sent my uh, tissue sa I mean, uh, tissue sample out to Foundation Medicine, and I was diagnosed, di <clears throat> and they determined that I had a KRAS mutation which was later confirmed now that Kaiser is testing for genomic okay. mutations. Okay, okay. Which is very good. So um, I'm very happy that I did that early on because it's uh, not that it guided the course of, of uh, treatment so much, but it kind of confirmed uh, various uh, ways of going about treating the disease, and it just uh, reinforced the kind of treatment that I had chosen. Was that a That's recent great. switch to immunotherapy? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought so. Yeah, I was on chemotherapy, not on immunotherapy. Yeah. yeah. You had standard chemotherapy first. Standard. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And how long have you been on immunotherapy? Uh, since the spring. Okay. Yeah. That's May, great. May or so. And, and okay. was any testing done to determine putting you on immune therapy? Yes. Yeah. They they determined I had a 80 uh, percent PDL1 expression. Which is very high. Yeah. So that. Which is also a marker. Yes, that's yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think that what needs to be done is I think that the uh, 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 HMOs like Kaiser just have to get with it and start doing more thorough testing. That's all there is to it. I was yeah. I, I didn't care about whether they cover the initial panel, you know, that I I requested or not. I just said let's just do it. If I have to pay for it, I'll pay for it. You know, I don't care. And I, I, I advise every, anybody to do that. If you, you know, it's it's worth it. So uh, that that that's been my experience. Thank you, Fred. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, my name's Rick. I uh, was diagnosed in February of 2015 with non-small cell adenocarcinoma. I've been treated at Kaiser as well. Um, I went through uh, 12 months of uh, standard chemo and um, towards the end in October of 2015 I had um, um, I had one of my tumors wasn't responding, and so we, they did surgery, sent the sample off to um, Foundation Medicine, and what it did was it um, just reinforced the path, the direction my, my doctors were, were taking. I ended up not having any of the EGFR, ROS1 kind of mutations or expressions. So, um, but just a couple months after that, in February of 2016, I've been um, net ever since. So no existence of disease. So, yeah. so no markers showed up on your test. Correct. And you've been on what therapies? I'm curious I was, because the, MD is awesome. The, the first type of chemo I was on was carboplatin olympta, okay. then olympta only. And then after my surgery, I was on Taxotere. Okay, okay. And, and when you progressed, did they take? Did they do another test or? No. No. They okay. did the they did the test after they had um, done the surgery, so that's where they got the the best sample. Okay. I didn't have okay. one done on my initial diagnosis. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I'm Rick, and I'm here with my wife for the last six years, <laughs> and here she is, and she'll tell you her story. <laughs> Tina. <laughs> I'm Tina. Um, I was diagnosed in 2010, November, so I'm coming up on seven years here. Yeah. Um, I did test positive for EGFR um, from the get-go, but they thought that I could also maybe have a better outcome with, uh, at the time in 2010, um, with radiation and chemotherapy standard care treatment. And um, after I finished radiation and chemo, I went on Tarceva because I was positive for EGFR, and kind of, I guess, for insurance. And I've been on it ever since and have been having clear scans for the last six years, so that's really great. Um, just lately, though, I participated in a um, research study, and they sent my blood work to Foundation One, and no mutations showed up. Hmm. Nothing. Hmm. So I don't know, does that mean no cancer? because there's no mutations, because don't you have to have a mutation to have cancer? I don't know. But anyway, then my second blood test that came from the research study at Stanford showed they did find a tiny little, the tiniest, most smallest detectable cancer sloughed off dead cell hmm. in my DNA. So um, my question is, what is the significance of that? That's a great question. Let's keep going around the room, but uh, I, that's, okay. that's a great yeah. question. I'll come back. Yeah, cataloging some really good ones yeah. here. There should be a new driver yeah. there, somewhere. Hi, I'm Sally, and I was at very high risk, so I entered a study, the International Early Lung Cancer Assessment Program, and uh, they found nodules in all my lobes, and uh, I was watched, and after about five years, one of them grew to the point that they felt it was malignant, and I ended up having my lower right lobe removed, and there was no spreading. Of, I mean, my lymph nodes and everything were fine, so I have been NED for the last eight and a half years, um, I'm being watched because uh, of the nodules. And as you talked about having, you know, knowing about a uh, sample from before, uh, when I was about four and a half years out, I said to the oncologist, I can still get a hold of my tissue. 
because I checked at the hospital, it was a community hospital. And I said, so I'd like to have it tested. And he said, you're so far out that I don't think that that would be worthwhile if it comes back or if anything grows. And he said, then we'll test. Well, I cried a little bit because I wanted it done, but um, it, it hasn't been done. And knock on wood, I'm fine. And when I saw him in August after my last scan, um, he said to me, uh, my, I have ground glass nodules just like uh, Esty does. And he said to me, truthfully, I think at this point, if you get lung cancer again, it's not gonna be from the nodules that are there now. I think the largest is eight millimeters. And he said, I feel if you get it again, it will be a whole new primary entity. And, which kind of makes sense because my mother had it three times. She lived 22 years with it. Um, they never, dis in 75 when she was diagnosed, they never discussed staging with us, but they said it was found early and she didn't need treatment. And then two and a half years later, she had a separate primary and then she lived almost 20 years more with nothing. So if I can live like she did, I'll be <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> so that's my story. Thank you. I'm Ina, and I was diagnosed accidentally, uh, just went in for something completely unrelated, and they found a, um, this was two and a half years ago, um, they found a hard-boiled egg-sized, I'll just say that because it's easy to visualize, tumor in my left upper lobe, but um, nobody could ever get cancer cells. Every, we agreed that it needed to come out, but when I went in for my surgery, there was never any positive uh, cancer cells. And the reason there were no positive cancer cells were because, was because the tumor actually was not cancer. My story would probably be very different if it were. Um, but inside of it, kind of like a yolk in an egg, although much smaller than a yolk, was um, a, a cancer, an early stage cancer. Um, and so I have a left upper lobectomy, and um, I've been watched. In fact, I just had a, a week of scanxiety because I just got my uh, scans back last week, actually, and um, full body, and it was it was good. But a lot of similarity with what Sally was saying. I have. Um, they believe that what I have was scar tissue carcinoma, which is extremely rare. And I don't even know if it would be susceptible to anything. It was caused by a mycoplasmosis uh, pneumonia that I had like 16 years ago. And so I have a lot of nodules on the right side as well, but they're tiny and they haven't grown since 2006. So we're just watching them. But I don't, you know, I don't know if we have tissue, but I don't think we've ever done anything with it because they said it was scar tissue. Mm. So I'm not sure if that even goes into the, you know, gamut of, of could you do anything with it if you needed to. I don't know. But in the meantime, I'm very grateful. I feel great. I'm fine. And I like to be here. <laughs> Don. Oh, good evening. Uh, my name is Don Stranathan. I'm from uh, Santa Rosa, California, uh, stage four non-small cell lung cancer, um, adenocarcinoma. I was diagnosed in June of 2009, and I was also, I'm also with Kaiser, and um, at that time they weren't doing, all they found out was it was adenocarcinoma. So I was offered chemotherapy, tax on carbo. I advocated until I got them to add a vast into my mix. So I got the, the three, the cocktail, a tax on carbo and a vast, and along with radiation. And then um, after that, I had Gemzar for some uh, nodules in my liver. And my oncologist just handed me a bottle of Tarceva and said, try this. And I was fortunate. I, got, I received six years out of Tarceva um, stable. And then in 2015, um, I, over these years, I, I knew I had never been tested. So in 2015, in November, I, I discovered through a blood clot in my leg that I had a new tumor in my left lung. 
and I immediately said I wanted a brain scan, a bone MRI, a PET scan, and a biopsy done, and I wanted it sent out for multiplex sequencing. I reached out to Bonnie, and she connected me with a friend of hers, Deborah Morsini, in 2015, so I had a full panel done, and what was discovered was, even though I had been stable on Tarceva for six years, I didn't have an EGFR mutation, no EGFR, no ALK, no ROS1. All that showed up was an NTRAC1 without fusion and a PIC3. So I, I reached out for a second opinion to a, do, uh, a doctor at Mass General, and, and he said, based on my history, I should do very well on immunotherapy. So I went on nivolumab or Abdevo in um, uh, beginning of 2016, and I was uh, my tumor didn't grow for uh, for 36 uh, or 37 infusions, and then. Actually, I was down here in August at a, at a living room, and Bonnie mentioned that, you know, side effects can be worse than the treatment if you don't report them. And I'm sitting here thinking, I can't breathe. <laughs> so I went in, and uh, they thought it was pneumonitis from, uh, from the immunotherapy. But what it was was that I had uh, three liters of fluids in my periocardial sac. Mm -hmm. So they had to do uh, periocardiothentesis and remove all the fluid. So I, I reached out to uh, Krista again at, at Foundation Medicine, and uh, I asked if they could test periocardial fluid. And they said if it was spun down, it was 20% tumor content, spun down to pellet or paraffin embedded, they could test it. And I, I just got that report back about uh, probably about two or three weeks ago. And what I noticed was I still have no GFR ALK or ROS1. Um, but I did have an EGFR amplification, which is just means there's an overexpression of EGFR. So that was interesting. But what was very interesting was that um, they're now testing for tumor mutation burden. And I had a 2% PDL1 expression, but I had 17 MUTS, uh, uh, which is intermediate expression of the tumor burden, uh, close to high. So um, when there were malignant cells in that fluid, I had to be switched to another treatment. So I'm now on Genentech's new um, immunotherapy to centric. So I'm, you know, knock on wood, the fluids haven't come back yet. So I'm just going one day at a time. <laughs> and this is what happens when you're an educated patient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. This is, this is what happens. Yeah. And this is, this is the whole reason we do what we do. This is it. On Facebook, yeah, he I does. Mean, everybody on Facebook yeah. that has lung cancer yeah. is Don, <laughs> yeah. and it turns to him. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> we call him. We call him Doctor Spanish. Yeah. Hi, I'm Betty Corner, and I was diagnosed three years ago with um, adenocarcinoma. I had a primary in my right lower lobe. I'm a never smoker. I was in great shape. And the doctors were surprised, and I was surprised and uh, a little disappointed. Um, we, let me think, I was about to have, have my right lower, lower lobe removed, and um, the MRI found brain metastasis, and um, the surgery was off. But my doctor um, was in, in Courage that I was healthy and that the tumor was small. I went on Tarceva when they tested my tumor, and um, it was EGFR positive exon 21. And um, with CyberKnife and with stereo um, CyberKnife and Tarceva, my uh, cancer was fairly well controlled. And um, right then, the the guidelines were changed, so um, it was encouraged that if you had oligometastic cancer, um, lung cancer, a, an aggressive treatment was recommended, which encouraged surgery. Um, so I had my right lower lobe removed. So surgery was off, surgery was on, surgery, you know. And but I did it, and it it worked really well. And I am still on the Tarceva. Um, last year, I had um, one of the lesions appeared to be growing. They weren't sure if it was necrotic tissue. And, and the only way to, to really go in was to, to go in and look. Um, I, so I had some brain surgery. Unfortunately, it was small. It was about one centimeter, and they missed it. Um, mm. 
the location of it was was not what they were hoping, you know, what she was hoping to find. Um, and they decided to wait and see. But my last MRI shows that it has shrunk. Uh, and so it has become smaller. And my uh, radial neurosurgeon believes it's necrotic tissue. So I'm very happy for that and uh, encourage people to not be despondent if you have a wait and see in your, in your diagnosis. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hector Gonzalez, Jr. And uh, my father was diagnosed with uh, lung cancer this July. And uh, then we saw Bonnie's segment on Channel 2 News. And um, the next morning, I reached out to Emily. I sent a pretty long, sad email. And uh, a couple days later, she responded, um, gave me some hope. And just listening to all of you guys here tonight, uh, I am not educated at all. Uh, but I think I found myself in the right place. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity, so um, I, I'm really, truly grateful to be here, and uh, I'm getting choked up, as you can tell, but um, I'm really grateful for each and every one of you, so uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Tian Ho. I work for um, Genentech. Hi, Don. Please spoke on the phone. <laughs> um, I love coming to these uh, just to hear all of your stories, and um, thanks for having me here. Yeah, and uh, I'm Nikki. I also work at Genentech, and it's an honor uh, every month to be here with all of you. I think we got it. Do we have somebody outside? Nope. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, you have a lot of lot to do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All the answers. But yeah. um, <laughs> uh, you know, we're really we're really proud that that our we call them our patients are so well educated and and know the process because that's a huge huge issue out there in the big world because. Not all of the physicians in communities, and maybe even some academics, are totally up to speed on a, on a daily basis with all of the things that are available out there. So on that note. Well, I think the, the most important thing uh, for me sitting here tonight and having had two family members with lung cancer is how impressed I am with your knowledge, with your self-advocacy or your, your uh, caregiver advocacy, both of those. Uh, that makes a huge difference in your outcomes, regardless of, of what else you do, but to, to educate yourselves and to learn what to do in order to have a positive impact on your care is, is amazing to me. So kudos to all of you. And uh, I've heard some really good information about uh, what you are doing to take care of yourselves. And I want to also, uh, at this moment, also encourage you to, based on some of the information, keep pushing your insurance companies, keep pushing your healthcare providers to uh, learn more about genomic sequencing and to uh, make some of the changes that are going to impact your care and, and future, future patients' care. Because the more we learn about lung cancer and the more we know what each one of you has that's driving your lung cancer, the better we are able to help you. So I think based on all of the alterations that, that were discussed here, I'm gonna just flip to another slide that we can just kind of look at as we talk through here. I heard EGFR fairly consistently. That's one of the, the most common alterations in lung cancer. Um, depending on the publication, it's anywhere from 10 to 25% to of patients have some type of EGFR alteration. Uh, Sherry, before before you uh -huh. go into this, okay, I think everybody in the room and everybody online would love for you to explain. They hear they hear comprehensive genomic testing, comprehensive genomic profiling. They hear deep gene sequencing. Molecular they testing. They hear molecular testing, biomarker testing. Can you kind of wrap all that up and and give them some input on all those different names? 
Yeah, so those are all names for a variety of tests that are used to identify those alterations like EGFR or whether or not you'll respond to immune therapies. And there's a broad spectrum of tests on the market. Uh, historically, the first tests that were run were single gene tests, as we called them, where we would look at just EGFR, for example, uh, or, or the, the pathology lab would test for KRAS positivity. And, and those tests um, require a lot of tissue. They're often um, a, a different type of test than, than the genomic sequencing that we look at today. Uh, and, and they don't give you a lot of information. So um, one of the, the wonderful things that has occurred in, in our lifetime is that we've understood more and more about the human genome. And with that understanding, we've also been able to decrease the cost to run these types of tests. And so going from single marker testing, which was the, the normal test uh, in the early mid-2000s, uh, to understanding more all of the genes that are involved in cancer and having the scientific technology to test for those genes, we now have more and more comprehensive tests to identify the, historically in recent years through tissue and now with uh, blood biopsies, we can identify what's driving the cancer. So, so single gene test, uh, multiplex is another term, so five or 10 genes, maybe up to 50 genes where the uh, test is looking at spots that are known to be involved in cancer, but not the whole gene. So again, the, the gene or the whole sentence, if you wanna put it in that terminology. Uh, the, the methodology that Foundation Medicine uses uh, looks at 315 genes. So that's a broad spectrum of genes. They also look at not just hot spot or single points on those genes to identify the alterations, but the entire gene. So, so it's, it's uh, I like to use the phrase casting the net wider. So uh, you might have the EGFR alteration that's found fairly commonly, but you might have an NTRAC alteration, which is very rare in lung cancer, but very targetable. So casting the net wide to identify what genomically is driving your cancer is going to be your best opportunity to identify treatments for that cancer. And so, so again, if you're having the conversation with your physician, uh, they may say, oh, we don't need to do all those tests. We're just typically looking for EGFR or ALK, these, these lovely uh, alphabet soup of, of genes. Um, but what you want to do is say, no, I want to comprehensively look at what might be found in the tissue and is driving my cancer, not just the common or the easy to find genes or the easy to find specific alterations. And, and added to that, and this is complex, it, it's uh, very new science. We're also now able to look at the type of gene alteration. So um, alterations uh, in EGFR might often be a single base alteration. So you might have uh, an L858R alteration, fairly common alteration, but you might have an amplification of EGFR. You might have uh, an exon 19 deletion or insertion. And these are not typically found with your usual tests that, that might be in the pathology lab in the hospital. So, so again, casting that net across all the types of alterations within each gene that might be driving the patient's cancer is where we're at uh, technologically today. So what does a patient <clears throat> go to their physician and say, I want a comprehensive genomic test for 300 plus alterations? Yeah, so I, I want a comprehensive test that's gonna look at uh, as many genes as we can, so in this case, 315 genes, and looking at all four classes of alterations in those genes in order to identify what's driving the patient's cancer. And, and I, I'll, I'll share a little anecdote here because I, I understand personally how difficult this is. It was just a year ago that I was in uh, looking for a neuro-oncologist for my son. So we were looking for the right oncologist. And in the first neuro-oncologist's office, I said, and I work in the industry, so I was able to say, I want comprehensive genomic sequencing and I wanna run the foundation test. And the, the uh, neuro-oncologist said to me, oh, we don't need to do that. Well, that was the end of the visit because I knew we needed to do that. I knew we needed to identify what was driving his tumor. 
And so I went to another neuro-oncologist who said, I don't know a lot about it, but help me understand what it is and I'd be happy to order that test. And we ran the test and were able to identify the specific sequence in the, the genome that, that was affecting his tumor. Um, so so um, being able to talk to your oncologist and say, this is what I want and this is why I want it and I'm not going to take no for an answer, or finding an oncologist who understands better, um, who's willing to work with you. I, I'll, I'll take a step back and, and acknowledge that our oncologists, uh, this is fairly new to them as well, that what we can do today, we couldn't do 15, 20 years ago. So, so even knowing what genes we're looking at is new to many of our oncologists. So <clears throat> I, I think all of our patients have heard um, high mutation burden, uh, PD-L1, EGFR, l cross one HER2, blah, blah, blah. Um, how, how do they decipher uh, whether it, it is the 315 gene panel, does that include high mutation burden? Does it include PDL1 and other markers that are known to be causative uh, or uh, a marker for immunotherapy? Yeah, so we're very lucky to be in the era of immunotherapy. I think we're at the, the very beginning of it and we're going to learn more and more about it. But the three methods that we currently use to identify whether or not a patient is likely to respond to the immune therapies is to look at PDL1 protein expression, which is separate from this, uh, but it's certainly run at our lab and, and most laboratories. Um, the second and third methods are to look at what we call tumor mutation burden which is uh, an, an algorithm that we run on those 315 genes to identify whether or not the patient has a lot of tum uh, mutations in the tumor, not just EGFR, for example. So we're looking at tumor mutation burden. We also look at another funky thing, microsatellite instability. And, and the, the part of the, the excitement right now is that microsatellite instability was recently um, uh, acknowledged by the FDA to be a method to measure tumor agnostically, so across all tumor types, whether or not a patient might respond to the immune therapies. So, PDL1, tumor mutation burden, or TMB, as we call it, and MSI, or microsatellite status, three methods that, that are measured that, that you can get when you order the foundation uh, medicine tests. And TMB is pretty recent that you've been testing TM for that. Correct? TMB is fairly yeah. recent as well. So, yeah. so those uh, we had done as research tests previously, but in the last uh, couple of years, we've uh, implemented those as part of the, the regular test report. And um, with that, um, we're, we're able to generate those, those uh, numbers that, that will inform whether or not a patient is likely to respond. And that's important because the immune therapies um, can be uh, fairly toxic uh, and they're very expensive. So we want to make sure we're giving them only when they're really going to help the patient. And, and we're, I'm, I'm sorry, I, that's okay. I keep talking. Yeah, that's okay, you're supposed to. <laughs> um, and this is an evolving field. We are learning more and more about that. And, and part of that, that comprehensive genomic sequencing, we're also learning that you may have a high tumor mutation burden, but there might be a couple of other genes that are found to be altered that are going to say uh, that you probably are actually going to hyper progress as opposed to respond to the immune therapy. So you don't want to just get tumor mutation burden. You want to get that 315 gene analysis to look at those other genes. And, and we're seeing more and more evidence, it's, it's been coming out at the last few conferences, that PDL1 has been a nice historic marker for whether or not a patient will respond to immune therapy, but tumor mutation burden and microsatellite status might be more informative. So, so getting the TMB and the MSI are very important. Okay, when I have one more question about tumor mutation burden. Um, does the patient, the lung patient, have to have one of the 11 known markers, uh, you know, EGFR, uh, do they have to have one of those markers uh, in the, uh, to be a, a candidate for immunotherapy? Or can they have other, just a high load of markers that are not necessarily relative to lung cancer? Uh, yeah, so if they have a high tumor mutation burden, not specific to genes, you know, gene EGFR or gene KRAS, but if their tumor mutation burden is high, 
they are um, eligible for the immunotherapy. Okay, because I think some patients thought they had to have like an EGFR and an ALK and a ROS1, and that was the definition of high mutation burden. No, the definition of tumor mutation burden or high tumor mutation burden is specific to the overall count, and it's calculated based on the number of genes that are interrogated, and, and um, there's, it's very complex math. I won't bore you with it, but um, it, it, it gives you a number that says this, this patient has low, uh, intermediate, or high tumor mutation mutation burden. Now, to, to the, the, the point about do they have another um, alteration, there are combination therapies that are in clinical trials or in, in FDA approval that, that say when to get immune therapy as opposed to a chemotherapy or a targeted therapy and immune therapy. But TMB alone is a marker that's relevant for uh, likelihood of response. It's not 100%. There's no 100% yet. This is still science. It's not exact. Okay, Michelle, you have a question online? I do, I have a few. <laughs> okay. So we'll start. Um, so Susan wants to know, she wants to better understand the difference between proteomics, DNA, and RNA testing. That's a very good question, uh, and I wish I had a schematic because it's a little complicated. Uh, you learn this in biochemistry, so, so please feel good that you don't necessarily know this. Um, your, your, your DNA that, that I showed you the picture of, which is our building block or our blueprint for everything that happens in the cells, that's essentially telling the cells what they're going to do. That DNA is converted to another molecule called RNA. And the RNA basically translates the DNA to protein. And the proteins are the actual building blocks or the, the functionality in the cells. So when we talk about EGFR, there's the gene EGFR that codes for the protein EGFR or epidermal growth factor receptor. That's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> so, so DNA is the copy that converts to RNA, which becomes eventually the protein that is doing everything from making us blink to, to um, uh, take a breath, et cetera. Michelle, you have another question? What's the difference between an alteration and an amplification? Ah. So an alteration is the generic term for any type of change in the gene. An alteration can be a single base substitution, it can be an amplification, it can be a large insertion deletion, it can be a change in, in rearrangement of genes. So, so there's four types of alterations. One of those types is an amplification. So the amplification specifically is when that gene is, is basically telling the protein to produce itself many, many more times than it's supposed to. Does that make sense? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> just, just on our heads. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Got no, it. no, no. Yeah. Don't ask me again in five okay. minutes. But sure. You'll be tested. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Are we good? There's a couple more. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Let's go. How comprehensive is the liquid test? Okay, so, so there are uh, liquid biopsies, as we call them, on the market now, and, and they come in all different sizes. Uh, the, the one that Foundation Medicine runs is a smaller panel of genes than our 315 gene assay. It's 62 genes. And the reason for that, I'm going to just get, give you a quick picture here. I'm, I'm a proponent of pictures if you haven't I like noticed. pictures too. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when we take a piece of tissue and, and we um, analyze it for any of those genomic alterations, um, we have about 20% of your tumor is, or of the tissue is tumor and the other is normal. So remember only some of those cells are growing uncontrolled and they get mixed in with, with the normal cells. So 20% of that is tumor. So it's fairly easy to, to look at what's in the tumor and identify what's genomically altered. Uh, when we take a, a blood test and, and we look at it, only about 1% of that is from the tumor. So the blood, um, what we find in the blood is basically those cells that are being sloughed off as the, as the cells are growing and dividing, some of the DNA, fragments of the DNA get into the bloodstream. So that's what we're looking for when we do a liquid biopsy or, or a blood biopsy. And, and um, because there's only about 1% versus that 20% that we can identify in tumor, we have to scale back at least at this point 
scientifically and technologically to a smaller number of genes in order to get information to, uh, back to the clinician and the patient in, in a reasonable time frame. We could look at all 315 genes still, but running the instrumentation to process that would probably take a week. And we don't want to take a whole week to get that piece of the, the puzzle taken care of. We want to get the information back to the clinician and the patient in a reasonable time frame. And, and to level set, reasonable time frame in the, the tissue diagnostic arena is about two to three weeks. Um, we've gotten it down to roughly 10 days at Foundation Medicine, but, but, but know that there's a, a time uh, process. So the liquid biopsy um, is a smaller number of genes because we're trying to stay within that same 10 to 12 days to get the results back to the clinician. And then what is the typical cost for the 315 gene comprehensive sequence powder? <laughs> What's the typical cost for the gene sequencing? So the, the foundation medicine test uh, costs, uh, if, if you look at the ticket price, $5,800. Um, if you are if with private insurance, they will cover a portion of it, and we have financial assistance for the patients. And, and I won't get into all the nuances with that. Uh, I, I want to focus on the science because that's that's what I am. Um, but uh, for Medicare and Medicaid patients, there's no cost to the patient. Don, I had a two-part question. You had discussed PDL1. I'm hearing in a lot of recent articles that people with the ALK mutation, even though they have high PL, PDL1, don't, it, that's not necessarily a marker that immunotherapy would work for somebody with PDL1. And then also, you had talked about hyperprogression, and I was wondering if you, if you could tell me what you know about MDM2 and 4. If um, I, I've been reading some small studies that, um, if you have one of those mutations that can cause hyperprogression with immunotherapy. You're, you're hitting on some of the, the key information coming out um, as we speak, and some of it is being presented at World Lung. So to first speak to, to the ALK rearrangement uh, and, and PD-L1 positivity, and, and I should probably, what, halfway through the evening, uh, let you know I'm not a clinician. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I will talk in more theoretical terms. Um, the ALK rearrangement, um, and I shouldn't joke, but I, I joked to my husband that if I got lung cancer, I wanted to have the ALK rearrangement because the therapy associated with it is really good. We've got a great target that, that really targets just the ALK rearrangement and has been very efficacious in the clinic. So, so I, not knowing specifically what you read uh, around that, I would say that the clinician is likely targeting ALK first because we have such a good correlation. It's an FDA-approved therapy. Uh, they're going to get um, a, a quick positive outcome without a lot of cost. Whereas the, if they also have a PDL1 positive uh, tissue, they, um, they may um, not respond to it. Only about 30% of PDL1 positive patients respond to the immunotherapy. And again, the side effects are pretty uh, significant, so, and the cost. So, so I think it all weighs into the clinician's decision. And I think to Sherry's point is, is that's where the clinician comes in, you know, to, to actually make an educated decision based on all of the different parameters mm -hmm. that are involved in this. And they're not all the same because every patient is unique and different. Right. The MDM2 that I was asking about is actually, I have a friend, I think she's probably online right now, that uh, was on Tarsiva. And then when she had progression, they tried her on nivolumab. Um, but because her tumor was in a hard position to get a biopsy. But later on, when the liquid biopsies came out, they did test her, and she was uh, T790. So she went from Tarsiva to uh, Obdivo and then to Decentric. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, she started having hyperprogression, and she does have that mutation in the MDM, too. So that, that's one of the reasons I was bringing that up. So, so the, the studies are ongoing, and I think we'll see more and more data as the year unfolds. But MDM2 has been associated with hyperprogression in uh, patients on immune therapy. 
But these are all, these are all, um, this is all information that is new mm -hmm. and we didn't have, you know, we were talking about outliers just a year ago and two years ago, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that perform really, really well for a long time and the ones that have hyper progression. But the more and more research that happens with all of this gets us to, you know, more laser targeted treatment programs. And, and that's one of the unique features of Foundation Medicine, which is that we have uh, tested over 120,000 patients, and we can look at the patients that, that have high TMB and what the patterns and the, the other alterations are, and then the association to whether they responded or hyper-progressed or had a, just a lack of response, and we're starting to see these patterns and these different alterations that, that are actually driving the field forward, and hopefully in the near future will allow us to be able to say, if TMB high, but MDMT, MD, yeah, sorry, MDM2 positive uh, will likely not respond to treatment. And the FDA is watching all of this, and they're going to make some decisions about what they put in the label based on this. Yep. 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 Um, I, I think we talked about this quite a bit, but can you talk about uh, the difference between a tissue test and a blood test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so to the graphic behind me, the, the, the first difference is uh, that the, in the tissue, you get about 20% tumor versus in the liquid, you get a very small percentage. So um, the, the standard of, of care is really, if we can get a biopsy, uh, it's best to get a tissue biopsy because we're gonna look at more genes, we're gonna get that tumor mutation burden, and we're gonna get more information about the tumor. But uh, a patient is not always a viable candidate for a biopsy, and that's when a liquid biopsy comes into play. We can get some information from a liquid biopsy, hopefully sufficient information uh, to determine treatment options. Um, a liquid biopsy then comes into play upon progression in lung cancer uh, or recurrence where um, we already have data on what was driving the cancer previously. And uh, one of the examples, I can't remember who had EGFR and then a T790M, was that? Anyhow, Run no, but that, that yeah. happens so, yeah. so frequently. So EGFR alterations like EGFR L858, um, uh, Exxon 1920, 21 uh, changes, et cetera, we give certain anti-EGFR agents to. And at a certain point, cancer is, is very uh, aggressive. It's gonna find a way around that treatment. And, and, and it's going to find what we call resistance mechanisms. So we often see in EGFR positive patients who've been on an anti-EGFR agent resistance alterations. And the most commonly found is that T790M alteration. So if we are using a liquid biopsy uh, on a patient who was previously EGFR positive, that EGFR, let's say L858, has disappeared from their tumor, but now T790M is showing up, we can identify that in the liquid biopsy. Uh, the important thing in, in a liquid biopsy is not to just look for a T790M because 40 to 50% of the patients will have a T790M resistance marker, but the other 50 to 60% of the patients, I think I did my math wrong, um, <laughs> sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> the, the other portion of the patients who do not have that resistance alteration are going to have another alteration. So again, casting that net finding what else might be involved in that patient's progression. And, and using our liquid biopsy, we're looking at that entire EGFR gene. We're not just looking for T790M. So I'm trying to stay on track, and you know, it, we have some questions, but you're, you're answering them before we're asking, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but one of the questions was, at times we see the T790 in blood before tissue. How common is that? Well, I, I can't quantitatively say how often we see that, uh, but we can see it in blood before we see it in tissue because, again, in blood we're looking at a pretty small amount, and, and so we're able to dial in our viewpoint to roughly 1%. So if it's at 1%, we can identify it. Whereas when we're looking at the tissue, if it hasn't grown in enough of the cells, if we don't have that, that new alteration in enough of the cells, say it's only in 10% of the cells in the tumor itself, we might miss it because we have to have a, a cutoff on our limit of detection. So it, it might be counterintuitive, but we can find some of these uh, alterations that we identify at progression at a very small concentration in the blood that is going to take a higher concentration in the tissue to be visible. 
And, and to that point, you know, we're seeing quite often actually patients that start with one marker, say an EGFR uh, mutation, and then progress and have another mark. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, using that EGFR example, if a patient has an EGF uh, L858 alteration and they're given that anti-EGF uh, drug, the cells with that alteration being targeted specifically are going to die. So you'll see fewer and fewer of the molecules that have that EGFR alteration in it. But the cells that are still growing that either didn't have a, that alteration or the few cells that have escaped uh, through a variety of DNA mechanisms now might have a new alteration. Uh, often it's going to be these resistance ones like the EGFR uh, T790M, but there may be uh, a small uh, group of cells that was quiet uh, previously, but as the, the larger number of cells have died off, they have the opportunity to grow and they might have a different alteration that, that now essentially takes over and allows those cells to become the, the majority population. You have a question? Yeah, I, I do. It's a little bit um, along those lines of, of finding it in the blood, uh, but it's a question we get a lot from patients who maybe uh, had surgery. Uh, they're going in, the scans are showing. Uh, Francis mentioned, you know, being clear, but you're always wondering if something is there. Uh, Tina mentioned she's in a, a study right now where they're running the test to find out what's going on. Sally's had surgery. And a question I get a lot from those patients is, are we at the point now that they could go in for a blood draw and have something run and use that to monitor and see something is growing potentially versus going through a scan or, or something along those lines? What's going on? Can we find it sooner? It comes up a lot, and I think it'd be great to address that. See it before you see it on a scan. See it before you see yeah. it. Well, there have been anecdotal uh, stories about that, but I will say that we're in the active research phase with identification of uh, progression before we see it on a scan and with identifying cancer before we would know that we have the cancer, right? So I mean, our, our best goal would be to get to a point where we can go in yearly to the doctor, get a blood test, and they, they can tell us right away rather than when we get to stage four. Uh, because we can do a lot more at stage one. But the, the research has not reached the point where that's a viable commercial method of monitoring um, whether or not your cancer has returned or whether or not you have cancer. Um, what we see, and again, this is kind of relative to the, the graphic I have up, which is um, you have to have enough cells that are actively growing for that DNA to slough off, get in the blood, and be measured. So typically, a patient who has one very small new nodule is not likely to have that uh, tumor identified in the blood. Um, it, it's typically what we call disease burden. The higher the disease burden, that we get more information. Although, again, with the complexity of the biology, this doesn't always um, have a real clear cut and dried uh, ability to say the nodule's too small, we wouldn't have seen it, or you have 10 nodules, why didn't we see it? So um, that being said, we're getting there, and I am very hopeful that in the next 10 years we'll have the opportunity in our doctor's office to get a blood test and know whether or not we're progressing before we get to scan. Can, can you see um, blood testing um, happening more, you know, David Gandera um, did a, a, a talk in here a couple years ago, and he talked to all the patients on who's driving the bus. You know, and his analogy was a bus and a driver, and it's going down the road, and you know, that driver happens to be EGFR, right? And then gets a little bit further down the road, EGFR gets off the bus, and another marker gets on the bus. So do you see blood testing uh, being able, if we do it more regularly and, and, and can get it more cost effective, if we do it more regularly in the patient's um, treatment process, that we could actually find that new driver before we see it on a scan? Yes, I, I think uh, we are very close to being able to do that. Okay. That's really good news. Yes. Really good news because, you know, tissue, tissue, um, is invasive and difficult and and biopsies draws, are no draw. fun. I yeah. I don't say hey I'd like a biopsy today. Right, exactly. Um, and yeah. uh, you know I don't like blood draws either. But right, they're less invasive. Right, and that 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 could be the difference in staging as well. 
you know, if, if you start out with a patient that starts with a marker at stage one, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you find it before it turns into a higher stage with the blood. So right. that's all very exciting yes. stuff. I want to make sure we pause just to make sure there's no questions from the audience or some of the things that they had talked about earlier that they might want to get a little more information on, and then we can get back to our list, too. Yeah. yeah. Lost the shell. I've got one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, Do you get feedback from patients? Because usually when they come, when I came in for my test two years ago, I sent you my sample and you ran the test. Do you get feedback from the customers, the clients, on how they responded to their treatment plan? That's a good question. We have not actively collected it. We are working toward active collection of the clinical data behind each patient. Uh, we get data from clinicians who are actively writing up their patient experience, for example, uh, or we look at cases that have unusual uh, alterations and call the physician and ask them how the patient responded. Did, did they put them on the, the specific therapy? How did they uh, respond to that, that sort of thing? Um, the goal would be to ultimately have clinical outcomes for every patient because the more we understand about whether or not a patient hyper progressed or had a response, the more we can add to the genomic data the clinical piece because that's really where we want to get. We want to take the genomic information and apply it to what happens clinically so that we can go back and make um, changes to clinical care based on what we now understand about the genomics as it relates to the clinical outcome. Great question. Um, <clears throat> do you have any idea how a patient can have these discussions with their physician, especially when their physician is not an expert in this field? I think I touched on some of this earlier, and, and I think the, the most important thing for me to recognize uh, when, when I've been in the oncology office is that a lot of this is new to the oncologist. So um, give them a break, but push them. So, so know that, that they're learning this and, and, and they're trying to do the best for the patient and they might be limited with the confines of the insurance company or what their hospital system is, is requiring them to do. So, so um, educate yourself, educate them, keep asking them why or why not, um, and just keep that dialogue open with them. I, I think that's the, the best thing to do. Uh, does Foundation Medicine have an 800 number or <laughs> something that a patient could call? And, and, and I'm serious about this because this is a huge issue for patients. I mean, they're, they're the ones with the cancer, and they're the ones that need the treatment, and they're the ones that need the right drug at the right time. So we can't be, you know, babysitting our physicians. Right. We, need to be, we need to be sure that they're giving us the right treatment at the right time. Um, um, I, I, you know, when the, when the report comes back, it's fairly easy to read. Mm -hmm. Patients are given the report uh, and if you don't feel like you're being, uh, your questions are being addressed based on the re information on the report, is there an 800 number that a patient could call to get more clarification? Uh, we do have an 800 number. We, we typically talk more to the physician than to the patient, but it's not uh, because we don't want to talk to the patient. It's because the physician is usually the one who's calling to ask the questions. Um, and, and often there's that, that uh, two-way dialogue with your physician. I've got the report. You've got the report. Tell me what it means. What does it mean to you? How is that going to impact my treatment? Um, we have MD consultants who talk to the physician, so I often facilitate calls with an oncologist who's gotten one of your reports and wants to understand better what the interpretation on that report is. So they call into Foundation Medicine and we connect them with an MD who has uh, treated, uh, let's say, in lung cancer and, and has some experience and exposure to the specific therapies. And, and so there's a dialogue that helps the oncologist understand better what to do. Um, I, uh, if, if a patient has questions and the oncologist is not answering them well, I, I think our client services could probably answer some of those questions. Uh, we aren't trained specifically on the patient's side, 
but um, the other piece to it would be if you're not sure you're with the right oncologist, it wouldn't hurt to call Foundation Medicine and say, I'm in this area of the country, who are the oncologists who are ordering Foundation Medicine? Because I'd like to talk to them. I think Michelle had a question. Yeah. Yes. What kind of tissue would work for a comprehensive gen genomic sequencing test? What, or what size, maybe? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, so I can, I can answer hopefully most of the aspects that, that would encompass. Uh, so if, if you get a, a, a tissue biopsy, we require a, a very small amount of tissue. Um, and the, the department that takes that tissue after surgery and, and they put it into what's called an FFPE block, and a very small amount is needed. Uh, we uh, really, once that block is cut into slides that are used, not to get too much into the technology weeds, we only need 10 slides, um, so, so that's uh, one of the pieces of it. So very little tissue is needed uh, from the patient in order to run this test. One of the, the difficulties in this industry is that often the clinician will order EGFR by IHC, for example, and uh, that uses two or three slides. And then if the patient's negative, they might test for ALK or ROS next and use up several more slides. And then by the time they get to, the patient isn't positive for the top two or three alterations we're looking for. The tissue has all been used up. So the, the goal is to go f uh, immediately to this more comprehensive genomic sequencing to get, again, a larger number of genes analyzed with very limited tissue. So this points to the importance of rebiopsy. So how often or when should a patient's tumor be rebiopsied? It's a very common question. So if, if a patient is doing well on therapy, there's certainly no need to rebiopsy. If a patient has done well and they are recurring or they're progressing, that's the point at which we ask the question, do we need to get a biopsy of what's driving the tumor now or do we need to, to do a blood biopsy? So those, those are two ways to look at it at that point. <clears throat> Do you know when an oncologist might be reluctant to order um, comprehensive genomic testing? Should there ever be a reason <laughs> to not do that? I don't personally think that there's a reason for that. Thank you. Because <laughs> neither do I. So neither would I. I I'd and like to do a follow-up on that, okay. if that's okay. okay. Um, as soon as I say Yeah, this. you go ahead. Because the patients are paying for the test, I think. I yes. think if they want it, they should get it. Absolutely. So, so mine is going to move a tiny bit away from the science. And the good news is you have a lot of really smart people on your team here who might be able to answer in case you don't know for sure. But one of the challenges we see, you know, in this room we are fortunate that the majority of the people had testing. We know that's not the case. So what are the challenges you're seeing within kind of the space to get physicians aware, to get patients aware, to really increase those testing rates because we do know it's so important if we're going to be talking about personalized medicine to have this information. Yeah, so um, the, the things that, that uh, I, I think my uh, colleagues can attest to, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of it uh, being a clinician facing often which is the concern about the finances for the patient. So they're legitimately worried that you're going to have one more cost incurred. So, so at Foundation Medicine, we eliminate that barrier. We do not want finances to be a reason not to get the tests that would get you to the appropriate therapy. Um, there is often in-house testing, and uh, they might run EGFR and then ALK in-house. And so there's reticence to do the comprehensive profiling before they've done their in-house testing. So, so that's an, another uh, pushback that we often get. So um, I'm, I'm, I went blank, so I'm going to throw it over to you guys. Okay. <laughs> what, are, what are other uh, resistances? I think part of it, too, is uh, physicians who've been, you know, doing this for a long time weren't necessarily trained on genomic testing. And so, you know, new companies and new technologies come out and we go to a physician and say, hey, I know you're, you're a great physician and you've been doing this for 20 or 30 years, but let's take what you've been doing and kind of flip it on its head and do something completely different and, and avoid, you know, standard of care, but look for a genomic picture instead. And, and it's an education thing. You know, physicians are incredibly busy. Uh, many of them are seeing 20 to 50 patients a day, sometimes depending, um, and just 
their ability to um, uh, take the time to, to learn new things or to differentiate between different tests. You know, there, there's multiple people that, that are, are vying for the, all vying for their time. And like Barry said, there's, there's uh, institutional uh, parameters and internal tests and different things that, that they have to abide by. Um, so it's, it's a challenge for physicians to really balance that all out. And it it's really comes down to an education thing, I think. And, and they may have had a bad experience 10 years ago before this technology was sufficient to, to really get the analysis that we do today. And, and um, you know, you have a bad experience and you lose a patient and, and you're hesitant to, to try it again. I, I also want to say that, you know, in the community setting, most oncologists are like, they're doing all kinds of oncology. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to have someone who knows lung only, that would be really rare in, in the community setting. Um, I know Kaiser in Sacramento is experimenting with that, where they have just doing lung or just doing bladder and, or breast, and so that's really hard on them. And then the other thing that's hard on them is that if it's not in the NCNN guidelines, we can't do it because it's not covered. And so getting those guidelines established that that's an option um, for coverage or for um, protocols would be is, is a barrier, I think. So that was a great, because I had a follow-up that, that's a perfect segue into, and that's, um, you have a group of patients who obviously are um, educated. Uh, they're people who are interested in being advocates and, and pushing, and obviously you're, you're speaking at a foundation that's interested in this. So what do you see are some of the steps we as a foundation could take? Uh, what do you see some of the steps that patients could take to try and uh, increase this knowledge and, and increase the use of these tests? <coughs> Again, putting you on the spot, but uh, we're going to steal your answers and use them. <laughs> I, I think uh, certainly advocating with your insurance companies, uh, advocating with the government. So one thing that we haven't touched on tonight is the 14-day rule, and I think that needs to be changed because um, for those of you who are not aware, uh, a patient goes into the hospital and they're a Medicaid a Medicare patient, um, they have to wait 14 days to get the test performed. And, and um, you know, my uncle was a victim of this last November where they waited 14 days to get the, the tissue to perform the test and at that point he was too far gone. And so we need to change that rule. We need to be able to get this testing done within the first 14 days of diagnosis and, and not wait for those Medicare patients. Uh, so that's another piece to and it. It's, dis it's discriminatory. It is absolutely discriminatory, and and um, your voices are the most impactive because you're living it, and because you don't have a commercial entity behind you that they perceive as biased. So so getting your voice heard, getting out there, getting uh, it with obviously the Vanio Adario Foundation is incredible. There, you guys are doing a lot of this work, but continuing to do it, having the conversations with your physicians, with the administrative staff at your hospitals. Just keep talking and keep pushing for what we need. You have anything else, Michelle? I, I have a question over here. <laughs> Oh, okay, I, I, I have, did somebody have a question? Yeah, in the back, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, I, I um, was, was not tested until it was established. I was stage four. Are people testing sooner now? I just met a woman who was stage one. She had her surgery. She was done. I asked her about her testing. She, she didn't know anything about it. She just knew she was there and she was done. Yeah. And, and lucky, she seems pretty good right now. But is, is that changing now? Are people doing that testing any sooner than stage four? People are definitely doing that. Unfortunately, in lung cancer, the majority of patients are identified at stage 3B4. So, so they're already pretty later staged. Uh, but um, earlier testing can certainly inform treatment options after standard of care. And there's, there's quite a few clinical trials going on out there right now on early stage surgical patients actually being tested and being followed uh, more, more, more uh, uh, comprehensively. It used to be where uh, an early stage lung cancer patient got surgery and just was sent down the road. No follow-up, no, no, you know, after treatment, no, Eve. so yeah. But it's slow, it's slow, slow going. Um, uh, can you talk to us about 
genomic testing and clinical trials. You know, I, I, you know, we're not starting to run out of time yet. We still have 36 minutes. But clinical trials to me are extremely important. And I'm a huge proponent of, of clinical trials. And sometimes, sometimes uh, a clinical trial may be the best first line therapy for a patient. Can you, can you kind of address yeah, so, so the approach to clinical trials is changing, and, and we are seeing more and more clinical trials that are actually utilizing the genomic sequencing as a basis for inclusion into the trial. And, and uh, again, if you look at a larger number of genes across all four types of alterations, you're going to have the uh, option to identify more alterations that might inform specifically a clinical trial that, that you might be eligible for. So uh, again, uh, we're, we're casting the net not just to FDA-approved therapies, but clinical trials so that, that you have more options available to you if we identify an alteration, like this NTREC alteration. Um, it's, it's an up-and-coming alteration that, that is being fast-tracked by the FDA because even though it's in a small percentage of patients, um, in, in clinical trials with NTREC positive alterations, they were able to really identify a targeted therapy that is going to go from clinical trial to FDA approval status. So, so that's part of it. Um, identifying these alterations um, it, as a field, we're, we're better able to identify the alterations than we are able to develop the drugs. And the clinical trials help us to develop the drug that is eventually going to be there for the, the patients enrolled in the trial and then the next generations of patients. You know, to David's point about um, uh, um, community <clears throat> physicians and the reluctance at times to, to, to do certain things and they're busy and, and um, all of that. What can we do? What, what is our role when patients come to us and say, I asked my physician and he, you know, he or she just says no. Um, what, what can we do as a group of yeah. needy people? I'm serious. Pick it. Pick it. <laughs> Pick it. What can we do? I like to, the idea. Yeah. <laughs> because, well, 80%, 80 percent, 80 percent of um, uh, all cancer patients, not just lung, all cancer patients are treated in the community uh, arena. And I can only dream because that's a huge barrier. So I just yeah. have to dream. What would this all look like? if all of those physicians were giving comprehensive genomic profiling right out the chute. Yeah. All so, of them, so boom. Mm -hmm. Move, moving to getting the physician on board, um, building that bridge with the physician as opposed to uh, just walking away. If you, if you like your physician, um, say, can I bring somebody in, me, to educate the physician, uh, to help them understand why it's important and how it's impacting patient care. I, th I think that's huge. Um, so, so educating your physician, I know it seems a little counterintuitive, uh, but again, this is the first um, full decade of genomic profiling that is being available to the clinician. Um, I was at ASCO last summer, and the uh, first year fellow said that this is the first year they're really bringing it into the medical schools. So hmm. be patient with your physician, but be forceful. Uh, if they say no, tell them you won't take no for an answer. You'll help educate them, whatever you need to do. But the more we can educate ourselves, educate our whole families, and, and uh, the education will just eventually get to everybody, and the physicians will eventually come around? Well, you know, I would personally love to see Foundation Medicine and other entities that do genomic profiling on major TV shows and, you know, Good Morning America and talking about this. I think it's, I think it's huge if 80% of the cancer population are not getting mm -hmm. what, what they should be getting and what they deserve. I agree. So I have a question from Danielle. She, right. she okay. texted me, asked me. Um, she mentioned uh, that Sally and Ina both have tissue um, from when they were first diagnosed. And isn't there a place where they could send their tissue 
to a study such as Castle. So it's going to give us a little plug. So it would be more beneficial and help the future of science. And wouldn't it be interesting to find out what their cancer had to say when they were originally diagnosed compared to now? Huh. Well, um, Sally was in the um, ILCAP program. Um, that tissue's out there somewhere, Wild Cornell, actually. And the ho and what hospital did you get your test in? Because they have the tissue. Now, I checked because I know one of the head nurses, and she checked with the oncologist, and they said they had the tissue. But my oncologist's point was I was almost at the five-year mark, and he felt that if they tested the tissue that was there now, that wasn't necessarily what was going to be if my if another nodule grew or another primary was there. That's why he was saying that if I had a new primary or one of them grew and they biopsied it, then he would definitely do the the testing on it. But the fact that I was almost five years out, he didn't feel it was worthwhile to to do it on the original. Tumor. So it's it's a, a research question if, if you have older tissue and more recent tissue to see the differences between the two. Uh, and unless you've had targeted therapy, it will likely not tell you anything about changes genomically that, that cause the driver to, to go away. But um, if a, a patient only has tissue from five years ago, if they're not amenable for a biopsy, um, it, it's often uh, worth testing that older tissue or getting a liquid biopsy. So is it, I'm eight and a half years out now, is it still beneficial to do that? If there are questions about your current status, so if you're progressing or recurring, then, then it might be worth looking at it. Um, certainly, uh, if you don't want a new biopsy, you could have that tissue run and do a liquid biopsy at the same time to see what you can well, see. Well, believe it or not, I didn't have a biopsy. Okay. They were so sure uh, through the IL cap and through the thoracic surgeon and pulmonologist I was originally sent to, they felt with my family history and the fact that I had been a smoker, even though I had quit many years before, that there was no question that it was malignant, but that they felt it was small, they were getting it early, and they didn't see the need for... And I thought I knew so much, because I'd gone through it with my mother, mm -hmm. I'd gone through it with my uncle, and and I was pretty brass about it. Oh, you know, I know more than the average person. I didn't know a thing, because things had changed so since my mother had had it last. So anyway, that uh, I never had a biopsy. I just have what they, the tumor that they took, and I assume they still have it at El Camino. But I mean, I can find that out. But my oncologist's point was that to wait if the one nodule they were watching that's now it's eight, only eight millimeters. Um, if that grew, then they would biopsy and they would have it all tested. So does that make sense? Yes. If, if, if you have a new growth, biopsying the new growth is the most relevant to how to treat the current <coughs> cancer. Andrea, I think uh, you had a, another one. Yeah, so no, I, I definitely have another question. But I, I think what Danielle was referring to is, Mom, when you were first diagnosed, they obviously resected, and they, you obviously have tissue, which later on they don't have because they can't find it. But we originally it. wanted to <laughs> collect that tissue to put it into a study so it would help future research, not necessarily for you. I mean, it was kind of a twofold for you, but then also for future research. That tissue is so valuable. For, for mm. multiple steps. Okay, well, yeah, well, we have a second foundation. It's called Alchemy at Area Lung Cancer Medical Institute. And we actually have a collection of stage four lung cancer tissue that um, um, our partners have shipped to us, and it's in a biorepository. And we do share it with four, four research projects. And we've talked about bringing in community hospitals to be part of that because community hospitals, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, you know, they, they need to do, they need to have the tissue for pathology, 
but they don't necessarily keep the tissue for an extended period of time. By law, they have we'll to take keep it. it 10 or 15 years. I don't remember the current uh, requirements, but um, it, it's not discarded. But, but, do they, but do they have the, the facility to really keep the tissue that long and keep it? Um, so, so they're typically in these FFPE blocks, and, and so they can last indefinitely. We have, uh, as an industry, tested the viability of these samples over the course of longer and longer time that they've been in storage, and uh, the data suggests that uh, five years is typical. You're not going to have a lot of uh, degradation of the sample. 10, 15 years, it's probably not very useful. Okay. Uh, I think one of the yeah. things that's unique about our castle study is, is not only are we getting the tissue, we're also getting uh, serial blood. Uh, with that as well, and we're collecting all the clinical and corresponding data that goes with that. So if someone was looking at doing a research study on it, not only do we have the tissue available, we have blood available for those to kind of compare in some cases, and then also the clinical data. So I think that's a big part of what uh, Danielle was alluding to, is just trying to expand upon that, not just have the tissue, but also be able to make it available for research in a bigger way. Uh, I can't remember, I think you asked the question uh, about the research with the tissue and, and doing those things. Um, and being able to really dig deeper. Do we know what happened with these patients uh, once they were tested? Do we know if certain patients, because of what would maybe have been there, now five years out they had a much better outcome to find those outliers. Yeah. Yeah. So what other things can we do to build or what can, can happen within the industry that might help us start answering those questions? Well, I, it's, it's hard to really collate all the clinical data just just through, to do it? it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a lot of work. Um, when I've done registries uh, previously, it's, it's uh, easily two to four hours going through the medical records at the computer and trying to input it into the uh, system. And, and we often are not asking the right questions, just in general. So, uh, and, and again, what Foundation Medicine is working toward is an ability to collate the correct clinical data into uh, pre-populated uh, areas of the right questions so that we're, we're going through the, the clinical data and identifying the information that's needed and, and not putting in 100% of the information because not all of it is going to be useful in the analysis. So, so working with uh, Foundation Medicine to perhaps collate the data that you have, is it in the alchemy mm -hmm. study, um, might be a really good way to start to put together the story behind the, the genomics of the, the patients and the outcomes of the patients. Because in stage four patients, rarely do they have surgery. So there aren't a lot of core biopsies from stage four patients available to do that with? Often the fine needle aspirate will have been pooled into uh, an amount and spun down and the, the cells from that put into an FFPE block. So, so there still might be a way to get to it. Um, looking at uh, blood, the liquid biopsy, that blood, we can't take stored blood for that particular test. It needs to be within seven days of draw but it, it might be a study that you look at in um, having uh, the patients uh, get tissue and get blood, run both tests simultaneously, and then uh, follow them prospectively to yeah. see the outcomes based on the therapies. What's it gonna take for us to, to make a genomic profiling standard of care? What, is, what do we have to do? Because, you know, I, I, can, I see all this direct to market now you know, and patients are very educated about immunotherapy can, only can because ask, it was on TV. Can I ask on that one as well? It's, 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 it's associated. To what extent are you uh, communicating to the National Institute of Health to make that a standard protocol? Genomic testing needs to be a standard protocol. So, so it, it really comes to uh, the National Cancer uh, association, the NCCN, as opposed to the NIH. The NIH is, is more focused on the research and the clinical trials, uh, and, and, and they buy into it in that they've done some of the early studies that have helped us be able to do what we do today commercially. Uh, I, I think it, it's, again, it, it comes down to education, 
uh, lobbying to the government and to the, the national organizations um, and uh, lobbying with the insurance companies because a, a large portion of the pushback we get is the inability to get it paid for by insurance. And, and you know, our, 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 our people are very educated and I mean they know what to ask for and they know what to do. But most patients have no clue when they get into that office and they're told they have cancer, any kind of cancer, what to do, you know, or to even ask for this test. I think we have to get out there in a big way so people know what to do in the event they need it somewhere down the road. Like immunotherapy, mm -hmm. we're spending millions, probably billions of dollars for these TV commercials. Why can't we do one for genomic profiling so patients know to ask for that upon diagnosis? That's what we need. I mean, that's the only yeah. way we're going to be able to educate people. We can't keep doing it one by one by one by one. I, I have personally seen the impact of the commercials with the immune therapies. Oh. Uh, it, yeah. Uh, it's, it's been good on two fronts, right? We, we've had um, great outcomes for the patients, yep. and we've had uh, patients who are asking for information right. on how to get on immune therapy. Um, unlike the educated Which group involves here, genomic profiling. Right? <laughs> so unlike the group here where, you, where you're educated, uh, you know, when, when my uncle was uh, diagnosed last uh, November, my aunt called me and she said, I saw Kay Truda on the TV. Right. So, you know. Um, Key Truda. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so so, so it, it definitely is impacting and, and as we continue to evolve the, the known markers around um, the, the TMB value, for example, like the MDM2, um, as the clinicians become aware of that, they're going to understand better that they need a more comprehensive test uh, in order to determine the best, uh, whether or not the patient is going to do well on immune therapy. So it, it's, it's another avenue that's going to slowly move the needle. Um, but yeah, uh, television uh, gets us far. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question? Can we get a mic over uh, Oh, again? you need a mic, Esty. Yeah. <laughs> and hold it up close. Okay. There you go. Okay. Um, if you have spots, because I had my surgery 14 years ago, and they have the block at Stanford and so on. Uh, you said 10 years. If it's 10 years old, there's no sense doing any more testing on that block, correct? Well, it's got less uh, potential to be viable, but yeah. it can't hurt yeah. to try. Yes. I would never throw it out. I Fort, well, they have it 14, <laughs> 14 years. Um, well, I'm curious about, does it pay to do genomic testing when you have all these spots, they call them ground glass, uh, they don't know what they are, but one of them didn't look right to them, and they did um, uh, the targeted knife, uh, you know. Uh, Cyber knife. Yeah, they targeted radiation on it, um, and they say they think they killed it. Um, does it pay to do a genomic testing to see if any of the other spots that I have that you cannot biopsy because they're too small? Is there any test that you could do to see if there's any value, any other way of finding out uh, is there anything wrong with those <laughs> uh, other than the uh, CT scan that they do periodically? Uh, but what Esty didn't tell you is that about a year ago she had uh, 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 a nodule who, that was. Who, who did? You did. You had you had radiation. Yes, I had targeted radiation with right. with, with uh, linear accelerator. Right. And yes. that would have been a great time for a blood test. But mm -hmm. I didn't know because I don't have an oncologist. I used to go to Hatter Wakeley, and uh, I don't know. She's busy now with a lot of stuff, and I decided. To, uh, so I just see doctor doctor. Uh, uh, Lou, what's his name? Lou, your radiologist. Uh, my radiologist who did the targeted oncologist. radiation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's quite a job. It took four hours to just put you in a little cup yeah. and, and yeah. they had um, 
Yeah. They had lasers on the ceiling and so on to, yeah. to, to, to yeah. get that little spot that they weren't 100% sure that it was uh, malignant. And it was too small to, to do anything to it other than to kill it. So what about the other spots is what I'm curious. Should, should I do any genomic testing or? Um, well, it, it, again, I'm not a clinician. Uh, what yeah. I'm hearing is that uh, they are not changing, and so there's probably nothing to worry about. So if one change, they just kill it one at a time if it does. Oh, but uh, knowing in advance, if you did genomic testing, maybe you find it earlier? I don't know. I don't know enough about it, so that's why I'm asking the question. So, so we're not at a, a point in testing that, that we can do early detection of cancer. Oh, I see. So you can't see anything early enough to, to see. Well, that's on TV, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw it yesterday. What? Hospital it, here says we can find it in the blood. They could find it early. in the blood? Mm -hmm. Early? So, so <laughs> there, there's... There, <laughs> There's uh, early studies with uh, circulating tumor cells that, that they're right. starting to identify in the blood, but it, it's not um, something that is available nationwide right now. If you want to, to reach out to them and see if you could participate in their clinical studies around that. I, oh, you have to have a clinical study. I mean, what if you pay for it yourself and not worry about insurance? And I'm, I'm not hearing that you're spots are big enough to get enough tissue to, to analyze. Are you talking about a blood test? I'm talking about the ones you cannot. Uh, oh, you have to get the tissue. Mm -hmm. You have to do a biopsy to analyze it. So I guess I didn't understand how it all yeah. works. Yeah. Or you have to biopsy the spots. Yeah. OK. This is all new to me. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's great. I didn't that's know. Okay. I'm sure other people that's have okay. similar questions. Yeah, so exactly. no, Michelle, you had someone online? I do. So someone would appreciate knowing your stand on RNA and proteomic testing in lieu, not in lieu of, but as well as DNA testing. So uh, the DNA testing has really been, in a way, the low-hanging fruit. The majority of the information that we know about uh, cancer is from the genome, from what is happening at the gene level with cancer. Um, sometimes we can see information at the RNA level, so changes in the RNA. And um, that also can be seen for lung cancer if we focus on, and I'm not going to get into the, the biochemistry, but if, if we focus on areas that are known to, to have changes with the RNA, we are testing those with our assay. Um, and for cancers that there's a lot of changes in RNA, we can identify that uh, using our foundation, our, our other assay that looks at more RNA sequencing. Um, and that's typically the hematologic malignancies. Uh, protein uh, expression is another test. So again, DNA to RNA to protein. Uh, the, the protein that's most commonly tested in cancer right now is the PDL1 protein. And again, um, you can look at PDL1, but uh, it's often negative and TMB is high, and those patients are responding to therapy. So, so the protein tests um, um, are a mixed bag because uh, if you think about your cells and what they're doing on a daily basis, the protein is the actual working, the, the functionality of it. And depending on the time of day, what you've eaten that day, if you've exercised that day, those protein levels might go up and down. So it's harder to get a real clear a measure of a protein expression level that might be impacting your cancer, whereas the, the genome, the gene piece has already been changed and that's static. It's not going to change over the course of that day. Ron? Um, I have a research question. Um, so many of the trials out there right now are doing combinations, immunotherapy A with known drug B or sequencing this, uh, immunotherapy with something. So lots and lots of immunotherapy trial combinations. But nobody really looking at, from what I can tell, why are we throwing the spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks? Why does it stick at all? <laughs> Is there much research going on into just the fundamentals of, of these protein alterations and, and, these, and these immunotherapies? Why do they work at all? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and I, I think there's a couple of different questions in, in what you were describing. The combination therapies are an attempt to really stop 
the cancer in its tracks because, as I mentioned, cancer is uh, ingenious in finding ways around the therapy. And in, in our body, there are multiple pathways of functionality going on at the same time. And if you have an alteration in a gene that, that's impacting a pathway over here, uh, and you target it that, the cell can find a way to get around it and go down another pathway, essentially. So the combination therapies um, that are being tested now are, are ways to try to stop two pathways at the same time. Uh, we have probably found a lot of the this gene's altered, this is the therapy that stops it, and now we need to look at more combinations, more ways around it. Specifically to the immunotherapy, um, I think we've just scratched the surface. Uh, the, the immune therapy that are, is working now is all centered around the T cells, which is just one piece of our immune system. Our immune system is immensely complex and there's multiple layers to it. And so we've been able to identify with the T cell, which is basically, the T cell is surveilling the body. It's looking for foreign bodies. It's trying to find what shouldn't be there. And when it finds something that shouldn't be there, it upregulates the immune system to attack it and remove it, as, as if we have an infection or, or that sort of thing. So um, the cancer is able typically to mask itself. And so when the T cell's looking, it goes by the cancer and it doesn't recognize it as foreign, so it doesn't upregulate the immune system. So, so this is the specific way these current immunotherapies are working. Well, there are other layers in the immunotherapy that, that we will likely continue to uh, research and evolve and, and develop another set of therapies later on. But, but these are the ones that are working in a subset of patients currently. So uh, as, as the research continues to grow and, and the understanding around all of the complexities uh, grow, we will likely get more types of immune therapies that, that work. Did I answer all your questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rana, I, I was um, fortunate enough this year to be one of the people who got to review a lot of the um, uh, uh, abstracts for the World Conference on Lung Cancer, specifically as it related to immunotherapy. And, and while I'm not uh, anywhere as, as well trained in terms of being a scientist, I've learned enough that I could kind of get an idea and be able to look at these and, and make some judgments about what should be presented, what was something that should be in a poster. And I can say there is research taking place into some of the questions that you're asking about. Um, I think it's still early in the game, to be honest with you, on those. But there are some smart people out there starting to ask those exact same questions that you alluded to, which I think is promising. Uh, I agree with uh, everything you had said, that I, I don't think we yet know why things are working. We're just trying these combinations. But there were a lot of papers, a lot of papers <laughs> written. Um, and what was interesting is many of them, because it is the World Conference, there would be one from the US on this topic that was exactly the same as the UK, which is exactly the same as from someone in Asia. And people are asking these big questions of trying to figure it out. So I'm, I'm hopeful we'll start to see some of that, um, those questions and papers and work come to fruition and give us a better understanding. Yeah. Thank you, David. Can yeah. you talk about CAR T cell? A little bit? A little bit? I, I, uh, I don't think I have enough background in that, okay. so I apologize, okay. but no. Okay, okay. <laughs> Danny okay. had a question? I have a question, a question um, Dr. Willis. Um, we all are talking about profiling, but I think the conversation has always been around the damaged um, genome, correct? Mm -hmm. So are we doing any profiling, or is the space moving in the direction where we can do familial um, profiling, That's right? So when you happen to have this as your day job, um, I learn about my best friend who I see every day, and she says, oh gosh, you know, my, my, my grandma died of lung cancer, but she was a smoker. So then the conversation ends, right? So, I mean, do are we looking at it from the DNA level and profiling propensity um, mm -hmm. as we have in some other cancers? Yes, uh, so, so there are a subset of cancers that are known to uh, often be familial based and I think a, a lot of the press uh, came around Angelina Jolie who uh, really I think helped uh, the understanding of the field by being BRCA positive. Uh, and so I'll use the BRCA 
alteration as the example. BRCA1 and BRCA2 are two genes in the DNA repair cycling. So uh, going back to my first or second slide where I showed the DNA, one of the ways that the DNA damage uh, replicates is that our repair mechanism isn't fixing it as it comes through that, that replication machinery. And, and BRCA1 and BRCA2 are, are well-known alterations that are inherited that cause uh, most uh, frequently ovarian and uh, breast cancer. Uh, we now know that there is a subset of patients with prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer who are also familially uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2 altered. So, so there, there is an understanding that there is some predisposition to cancer. Um, not all of the predisposition is well known because of penetrance, which is a term that just means uh, the, the risk that you will get a cancer. So you may have a, a BRCA2 alteration, and so your penetrance or likelihood of getting breast cancer or ovarian cancer, breast cancer as a man or a woman, ovarian cancer as a woman is high, but your likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer is not quite as high. So, so looking at what we do, we are focused on what we call the somatic alterations, the alterations that are just found in the cancer cells. But as I mentioned, 20% of that tissue that we have is from the cancer and roughly 80% is from normal cells. So we also get a picture of what's in the normal cell. Um, so if we see a BRCA alteration at a very high concentration in the tests that we run, um, it suggests that it might be germline or familial. So, so there is a potential to, to look at that from that angle. What, what we do as a company is we would refer the patient on for the familial testing. And the reason for that is the complications around the, the familial testing, which is that a patient must consent to it. So we are not requiring patient consent to run a, a test at Foundation Medicine because we're just looking at what's in the cancer. So if, if something's at a, seen at a high rate, the patient needs to go back to a company that runs the familial testing and consent to that test. There is a um, there is a uh, study going on at Dana Farber uh, called Inherit that is um, a familial lung cancer potential marker and that's an EGFR and T790 marker yeah. together and it we we have seen it um, three three um, um, grandmother daughter three generations daughter. thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Don, go ahead. Just then, a quick question. question. Um, I know there's been a lot of progress made on small cell lung cancer, uh, a lot of combos, immunotherapy that are uh, showing progress. And I get people ask all the time, um, they know that, you know, uh, foundation multiplex sequencing is productive with non-small cell. Is there enough uh, markers in small cell to make it worthwhile for somebody to go for a foundation one uh, test? That's a great uh, question, and I'm going to actually expand it across cancers. Regardless of whether there's often found alterations or the, the, the frequency in a cancer, um, if a patient is tested, we might find an alteration. So, so again, casting that net, whether it's small cell lung cancer, whether it's pancreatic cancer, let's see if we can identify an alteration that might be driving that patient's cancer. So it's always worth getting the test to see if we can find something. Andrew, we got about three I, minutes. Okay, so. so I just have one quick question. Yeah. So how does Foundation One testing differ from other companies when it comes to comprehensive genomic profiling and the size? So, so we're looking at a very large number of genes, 315 genes. We're looking at all four types of alterations in those genes. The majority of companies are looking at uh, limited gene, numbers of genes. They're often looking at hot spots, in other words, just small areas of the gene, and they're not looking at all four me. types of alterations. So I love that you have an NTRAC alteration because I can keep referencing it. The NTRAC alteration would not be found by 99% of other tests because it's a very unusual alteration that would not be looked for if we're not looking across the, the rearrangements, et cetera. All right. And NTRAC doesn't show up in blood either. 
Well, it, it will show up in blood, but the blood test isn't looking for it because it's a very complicated gene and it would take up too much of the real estate. Um, we are going to be adding that to our blood test uh, in 2018. Well, we do have to wrap up. Uh, I want to say thank you, thank for, you. to Sherry for joining us thank and, and having you. a great, yeah, thank please you. clap. This was great. Uh, for joining us. Obviously, some other thank yous, and then I'll get into our housekeeping items because I want to make sure we get our thank yous. Uh, thank you to all of our sponsors, Estellas, Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Genentech, Lily Merck, Novartis Tesaro, the Yahoo Employee Foundation uh, for supporting this and allowing us to provide this education uh, to the patients and the caregivers. Uh, a big thank you, as always, to Peninsula TV for coming out here every uh, month and doing a tremendous job broadcasting this. Um, it will be showing on the public access station. Uh, I know that that happens uh, on a regular basis, so please look for night. it in the middle of the night. Uh, obviously, the office bar and gr grill, who always uh, bring out the food for us for, for the, the event, um, our staff, and then most importantly, a big thank you to all the patients for coming here, uh, both in person, online, and all the great questions for tonight. Uh, a couple other final housekeeping items. Uh, we do have a special living room that's going to be taken taking place at Yale. That'll be on November 2nd from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. So if you're in the area, please join us live. If not, you will be able to watch it on YouTube. Uh, and then we, we're moving up. Can I, can I add to that? You the, can add um, to that. Okay. There'll be a panel with Roy Herbst. We got I'm 41 sure you seconds, all. so you... Well, we could, we, we're good. <laughs> Roy Herbst, um, Justin Blasberg, their thoracic surgeon, Roy Decker, the rad onc, Sarah Goldberg, med onc, and Emily Duffield, who is a nurse. It's going to be a panel, and I'll be moderating that panel at Yale. Which will be great. Um, our living room here in the office is moving due to the holidays. Uh, it's going to be on Wednesday, November 8th, so we hope all of you will be able to join us. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different topic. You know, we asked the question tonight about how our foundation can do a better job maybe educating and some ideas, but what we're going to be doing is asking the patients and the people online about how we can better serve you, and more importantly, bringing up the different people from our, uh, our team to talk about the work we are doing how we're measuring our work, the impact we're having, why we're focused on the areas that we're focused on, uh, things like early detection. Why is that so important? What are we doing? How are we measuring it? And then hear from you ways that we can serve you better. So it'll be kind of what's the foundation of our foundation? Or as someone said, it's going to be all about us, but really it's all about you because that's what we're here for. And then one final announcement, and this isn't necessarily our event, but the idea of this legislative advocacy came up and really making people aware. On November 2nd in Washington, D.C., there's going to be an event called the Life and Breath Rally. Um, our goal is to get a lot of uh, patients and caregivers and survivors there because we know 433 people a day pass away from this disease. And yet, even though that many people pass away every day, not our, our elected officials really might not be aware of that. More importantly, the general public might not be aware of it. So our goal is to get more than 433 survivors there so people can see there's a name and a face associated with this disease and start sharing those stories and making people stand up for lung cancer. So we hope you'll join us. Uh, I'll be there. I know a lot of other people will as well, and we look forward to seeing you and, and uh, having you be a part of that as well. So. Uh, and this was totally patient driven. All patient advocate driven. Patient Lisa Buonono. Yep. And several people that were at the yep. uh, summit in Washington, D.C. November 2nd. And you can go online. There's a website. You can register. Uh, they're going to be asking people to share the stories of those that maybe they know who've passed away. And certainly for our survivors, we hope they'll speak up and share their stories as well and make our voices heard. It's been too long. Too long coming. Um, but we need to change that reality, and it starts with all of us doing that. So a big thank you uh, to everybody again today, and, and I hope to see some of you there. And I'd like to bring up just a couple of um, our events that we're having coming up. Um, of course, our gala, November 11th uh, in San Francisco at the Fairmont. You can see Jennifer here. She's the cake deliverer, um, if you have any questions about the gala. Uh, we also have our Spartanburg, South Carolina 5K this coming weekend um, on the 21st. This Saturday, you can see Katie out there as well as Anna. 
and and Camp RM. She'll be out there as well. Um, we also, pending, we have our Healdsburg um, Marathon, so we're kind of waiting to see if that's still going to be happening um, on October 29th, but if it, if it does happen, you have to go see Danny run a half marathon, so give her kudos. We're going to make her run anyway. Oh, and we're going yeah, to crash gonna her house. house. Um, and then we also have the New York Marathon on November 5th, and of course, um, our uh, Lily's Light kite flying event in Hollywood, Florida on November 5th. All right. Well, thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Glad thank you could you. join us. You and thank awesome. you again. You were awesome. Yes. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you.